About 30 hours later, at 10.30 a.m. on Saturday, August 7, 1948, in a small room in the federal courthouse in Lower Manhattan, the HUAC subcommittee got Chambers under oath for the secret hearing. And for two hours, Chambers poured forth details about the Hiss family's daily life 10 or 15 years before. Here are some of the things he said or the facts he alleged. He said, Hiss knew Chambers. Hiss knew me not as Whitaker Chambers, but as Carl, C-A-R-L. In the early 30s, he said, Hiss had no children of his own, but his wife Priscilla Hiss had a son by a previous marriage. Her first husband was Thayer Hobson, who works for the publishing house of William Morrow in New York City. Her maiden name was Fonsler, and she hated her ex-husband. The son's name was Timothy, and he was, said Chambers, and I'm quoting, a puny little boy, also rather nervous, a slightly effeminate child. I think there was some worry about him. Thayer Hobson paid for the boy's private education at an expensive private school, but uh, Chambers said that they put Timmy in a cheaper school and gave the difference to the Communist Party. Chambers was asked about family nicknames. He said Priscilla called Alger Hilly, and he called her Dilly and sometimes Pross. They were commonly referred to by members of the Ware Group as Hilly and Dilly. Chambers stayed overnight in several Hiss homes for a number of days from time to time for free. He considered it an honor to have a superior in the communist underground staying in his home. He mentioned various cooks and maids they'd had over the years. The Hisses had a cocker spaniel they used to board in a kennel on Wisconsin Avenue when they took vacations on the eastern shore of Maryland. Chambers described several details of the insides and outsides of the several houses the Hisses had lived in during the years he said they were friends and secret communists. They did not have twin beds, he said. And when Nixon asked him, was there any special dish they served, Chambers began to open up. He said, no, I think you get into something else here. Hiss is a man of great simplicity and a great gentleness and sweetness of character, and they lived with extreme simplicity. I had the impression that the furniture in that house was kind of pulled together from here or there, maybe got it from their mother or something like that. Nothing lavish about it, quite simple. Their food was in the same pattern, and they cared nothing about food. It was not a primary interest in their lives. Staffer Ben Mandel asked Chambers, did Mr. Hiss have any hobbies? And Chambers answered, yes, he did. They both had the same hobby, amateur ornithologists, bird watchers. They used to get up early in the morning and go to Glen Echo out the canal to observe birds. I recall once they saw, to their great excitement, a prothonotary warbler. I never saw one. I am also fond of birds. Nixon asked, did they have a car? And Chambers said, yes, they did. Uh, when I first knew them, they had a car. And again, I'm reasonably sure, I'm almost certain, it was a Ford and it was a Roadster. It was black and very dilapidated. There's no question about that. I remember very clearly that it had hand windshield wipers. I remember that because I drove it one rainy day and had to work the windshield wipers by hand. And the car, he said, brings up something else. The Communist Party had a service station in Washington. That is, the man in charge or the owner of the station was a communist, or it may have been a car lot. The owner was a communist. I, I never knew who this was or where it was. It was against all the rules of the underground organization for Hiss to do anything with his old car but trade it in. But Hiss insisted that he wanted the car turned over to the open party so it could be of use to some poor organizer in the West or somewhere. And much against my better judgment, he finally got us to permit him to do this thing. And Peters, who was Chambers' boss in the underground and a major figure in Soviet espionage worldwide, he said, Peters knew where this lot was, and he either took Hiss there or he gave Hiss the address, and Hiss went there. And to the best of my recollection of his description of that happening, he left the car there and simply went away, and the man in charge of the station took care of the rest of it for him. I should think the records of that transaction would be traceable. At this, Stripling said to himself, I'm always very suspicious when someone tells me that something should be traceable. Because Maybe you planted the traces for me to find. Anyway, Chambers talked on and on. The Hisses never drank cocktails in his presence. He couldn't remember anything about the china, silver, stemware. He gave a physical description of the Hisses, including the interesting details about Alger Hiss, that he had rather long, delicate fingers. And in his walk, if you watch him from behind, there is a slight mince sometimes. 
He said that when Hiss was a small boy, he used to take a little wagon, he was a Baltimore boy, I'm quoting here, and walk up to Druid Hill Park, which was up at that time well beyond the civilized center of the city, and fill up bottles with spring water and bring them back and sell it. My impression was his relations with his mother were affectionate but not too happy. She was perhaps domineering. Hiss had a sister and a brother, Donald, who was also in the communist wear group. Uh, he said, Donald Hiss was married, I think, to a daughter of Mr. Cotton, who's in the State Department. She was not a communist, and everybody was worried about her. He said, Donald Hiss was much less intelligent than Alger, much less sensitive than his brother. I had the impression he was interested in the social climb, and the Communist Party was interested in having him climb. At one point, I believe he was fairly friendly with James Roosevelt, the president's son. And Nixon said, asked him, have you seen Hiss since 1938? And Chambers said, no, since the time I went to his house and tried to break him away, I have never seen him since. Nixon asked, would you be willing to submit to a lie detector test on this testimony? And Chambers said, yes, if necessary. And Nixon said, you have that much confidence? And Chambers said, I'm telling the truth. And they stopped asking him questions after two hours because they just run out of his, they couldn't think of any more questions to ask him. And they were impressed not only about all the little details that he mentioned, but about his tone. Several people who were in the room said he was, it was not that he was just reciting a lot of stuff he'd memorized. He was talking about someone he'd known and known very well. So the needle of credibility moves back towards Chambers, at least among the people who know what he's just said. Uh, another peek into Stripling's mind. He made some statements in later years about this whole case. It was quite interesting. He said, I was impressed by Chambers' tone, but in a different way. He said, uh, testimony before HUAC tended to have a kind of soapbox, antiseptic, very formal quality. But here's this guy just spilling his guts out. Um, and he later came to suspect, or he suspected at that time, and he said, that he, he, he told some tall tales in later years, but this is something he said to the grand jury just a few months later, so I tend to believe it. He said, I, I, I thought Chambers was telling the truth and Hiss was lying, but I didn't think Chambers was telling the whole truth. I thought he was holding something back, too. It was something withdrawn. He, he didn't quite finish the story. Um, and I, then I figured, I know what's going on here, because we asked Chambers, do you have anything that Hiss ever gave you? a gift or a present or a card or something like that, and Chambers said no. And Stripling said, if you're that good friends with somebody, you have something of theirs and they have something of yours. And then Stripling said, I began to put it together. I began to think, wait a second, I know what's going on. Chambers has, got a, has set a trap for Hiss. He does have something that Hiss gave him. And Hiss has walked right into it, and at some point Chambers is going to spring it on him. Um, and uh, he said, uh, Stripling, I had no idea what it was, though. But whatever the future, after this secret session, the few people who knew about it thought that Nixon's gamble might pay off, rescue HUAC, and maybe the young congressman had a good career ahead of him after all.